This video is sponsored by ThreatLocker, the zero trust security platform that gives you complete control over what runs in your environment. Learn more in a few moments. The script kitty writes info stealers. All right, in the last video of this series, we investigated the Redline info stealer, investigating and analyzing the core functionalities of the information it extracts, such as the device information, browser extensions, browser cookies, and much more. I'm going to write and simulate a info stealer script kitty style. I'm going to be writing this info stealer in the Go programming language. This is a language I've been wanting to learn for like the last, I don't know, three years. I'm just a Python noob. And really, I just thought this was a good opportunity, a project to kind of investigate the world of Go. Um, I picked Go for three particular reasons. It's statically linked, meaning that you don't need to install any dependencies on the target machine. It's execution time is very fast and cross compilation between uh, Mac OS, Linux, and Windows, well, it's friendly. In the last part of this video series, as I said, we extracted the Redline Info Stealer. And from that, I've gathered a few core features that I want to try to simulate and slash incorporate. Now, by no means is this comprehensive. So first is the feature of capturing basic device information in screenshots, basically cataloging the device that you infect. So maybe gathering their computer name, processes that are running, IP address, you know, some basic information, as well as grabbing the current screenshot of when when the particular user is infected to see, I don't know, I don't know well why. <laughs> Feature two, grabbing browser extensions, basically gathering a catalog of the installed extensions on the Google Chrome browser for this particular info stealer um, and understanding, you know, what kind of inf information that you can get from them. It's really just a catalog of the browser extensions and something that you could target later, maybe perhaps like wallets and things like that. Then to add on to that, feature three, cookie grabbing. So I want to grab the session cookies specifically to demonstrate session hijacking possibilities. So for example, if you decrypted the session cookie, you could install or uh, log into Google or Facebook or whatever you want to do and basically pwn from there. So with that being said, it's time to put mind into the skipped. All right, so do I know what I'm doing? No, is this a script kitty move? Yes, I'm going back to my roots. Script kid roots. Well, feature one, I don't know what I'm doing. Let's do this. Write me an info stealer. Ah! Looks like I'm gonna have to do this actually. Q programming montage will to feature one. In the first feature, I formalized myself with the Go programming language primitives. I researched how to organize Go code, print hello world, import external libraries, then used all this information to gather the host name, user account, IP address information, basically your device cataloging one on one and all the information you want. Boom, in one function. All right, so with a first pass around the dividing device information, screenshot information, I've learned a few Go primitives, which are pretty interesting. Uh, now, so feature one is quote unquote finished. Uh, basically, I gather all of the uh, information, such as the username, the user, as well as uh, the network interfaces, MAC addresses, and then I get a screenshot. One thing that I noticed while capturing my screenshot functionality was I was getting a blank screen and that's because I'm in WSL. So um, now I can add both of these functions into the main function and it should work from there, uh, theoretically. So wait, let me try this. Get device info. Okay. okay. Nice. All right, so I gather the screenshot. It's going to be blank because I'm in SWSL running this binary. And then here are all my IP addresses, MAC addresses that are blanked out because I don't want you to see those. Don't pwn me, please. I don't know. Information gathering here. On to ChatGPT. Okay, no, I'm joking. I'm not cheating this much. Kind of cheating. Not really. Feature two, ran through all the default locations where Chrome extensions are stored, parsed through the manifest.json file to gather version info as well as permissions, and purchased a screen. Boom, did that, and you're probably bored by now, so yo, 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 what is up, guys? It's Grant here. <clears throat> this took me an hour and 25 minutes to basically build out the browser extension capability. Basically, what I'm looking at is the manifest.json file, which gets the version of the extensions as well as the name and respective permissions. So inside Chrome, I'm looking just at the default Windows path, which means this is not a very extensive or versatile way of looking. So, you know, Firefox or Safari, this would just be, well, it wouldn't work. So I'm not thinking about that. When I run this, you're going to see all of the browser extensions, all of this text. And like I said, you get the version the permissions as well as the name. Um, so this is a good feature to go. And my next one is actually getting the cookies, which I don't know about you, but I don't know how to do this. So 
On to the next three. I parsed through the default cookies where they're installed. As of Chrome version 80, all cookies are encrypted, so we have to extract the symmetric encryption key inside a file called local state file. I didn't write the entire decryption function because of laziness. So instead I located and downloaded each of the respective two files, the cookies, local state, that would be then sent off to the C2. So quickly writing a C2 function server, I'm going to try to send this information to you know my local host server for the time being, and then, well, try to deploy this on an actual Windows 11 version virtual machine to see, well, what happens. My final step was to append all of this information into a plain text file in vo.txt, then write an HTTP sender method, which would send off to a quote unquote simulated C2 server. Connects with my calendar and gives me the information I'm looking for. Oh, looks like we had a little demo issue. I have finished the point of concept, the info stealer script kitty machine implementation. So using the powers of Go, it's easy to uh, build this into a Windows native executable, something that's super nice that I didn't really realize how nice it was. So um, up here on my machine using the Scammer 101 playbook, I have incorporated a quote unquote Adobe Acrobat machine uh, installation that is not actually real, of course. Now you can see that there is this little favicon. I tried incorporating this into the executable, but I was too lazy and couldn't figure it out. So if I double click on this here, what we should see is a terminal screen. Well, it really shouldn't see this, but if we actually click out of here, we can see that we get the information. So we get our screenshot, which is of course the dboo store at the time of execution, the local state file, which includes the encryption key, the, the encrypted session cookies, as well as the information, which is going to contain our network information, as well as the Chrome browser extensions and their respective versions and permissions. Um, now, in addition, I also create a small little C2 server functionality. So if I go into my Windows WSL, you can see that I created a little server.py using the powers of ChatGPT to implement a you know C2, basic C2 server. And um, at the time of execution, what happens is it will upload all of the information into an uploads directory and you get, well, all of the information here. So this is a small little point of concept, very limited, and uh, I didn't add extensibility to it. All right, so up here on a Windows 11 virtual machine, I have loaded the InfoStealer Acrobat program here, and what I'm trying to do is simulate what this would look like in a real world environment where any of the Go or dependencies are not installed. So if I were to double click this here, we should get some files and we see that disappearing terminal screen. And as you can see, it looks like we get the screenshot, but not the respective other information. There could be some errors in the code, but this point of concept basically means it works. Now, Windows Defender has been completely uninstalled. It's been disabled. And of course, in a real world environment, it wouldn't work. But in my Windows 10, machine I actually had Windows Defender up and running. And as you could see from, well, the previous implementation, I was actually able to gather the information. And this is a fully functional Windows Defender up and running. So what are some ways that you could actually like, you know, disable this or prevent this as a defender? Well, there of course are a lot of ways. And one foundational way that you can do this is through the use of allow lists. So allow listing, as the name suggests, is basically a way of only allowing certain programs, executables, and applications from running and then basically blocking everything else. So it's like a default deny and then you explicitly add. Now, allow listing, it's been around for a long time. It's difficult to do at scale, especially if you are in a business environment. And as cyber defenders as we are, it's difficult to do. Unlike antivirus or other threat detection programs, Allow listing is a means or a way of just looking at all applications and you don't have to determine which applications are bad or good because you literally just allow only the specific ones. On this Windows 11 virtual machine, I have a threat locker agent up and running. Now, threat locker is a lot of things, but at the core, threat locker is a zero trust platform. And what this program will allow us to do is block everything except the applications that we want to allow. So with my Windows 11 virtual machine agent here, as you can see, in the mode, we can have different modes turned on for this agent. So what you would want to do is you'd want to have a learning mode and a learning mode is set at 21 days by default. 
And this allows you to kind of understand the application behavior and what kind of programs your users are interfacing with. Now, once you've allowed those 21 days or whatever you want to choose, you can switch into secured mode. And this is going to apply a whole bunch of policies into this virtual machine. So double clicking into Acrobat, we now see a little dialog box that says, hey, Windows can't do this. And Threat Locker is basically saying, yeah, we blocked this. You can request access if this is a legitimate application. In this case, Acrobat is not a legitimate application. So like I said, allow listing, it's hard to do at scale. And so Threat Locker, what they've done is it's actually pretty unique and interesting. What they do is build out, they've built out a curated list of thousands of different programs that business users will be interfacing day to day, right? So Adobe Acrobat is number one there. Zoom, Slack, I mean, the list goes on and on. And typically your employees are only gonna be interfacing with, you know, maybe say five to 10 programs. That's about it. But that learning mode allows you to capture a whole bunch of other programs that may be like native to your internal environment and they'll allow you to pick that up and I'll add that to the allow list and then of course default deny by everything else. Here under modules application control, this is where we control the allow list. So I am on a trial version of Threat Locker and I, you can, as you can see, I only have 50 programs in a business license you would actually be having lots of different applications and you can filter down by the respective operating system, uh, which is pretty nice. And so you can allow various different applications and you can control this dynamically based off of your business. Of course, there's gonna be baseline applications like a Zoom, but then you have all of your internal applications, like I said, which is very nice. So allow listing at its core really is just about allowing certain applications and denying everything else. And that is how we get this Acrobat Info Stealer to be well denied, even with EDR completely disabled on this Windows 11 machine. So really cool. And we will be talking a lot more about Zero Trust in some upcoming videos with Threat Locker. All right, another dumb project in the books. Hopefully you've enjoyed the info stealer of writing. And well, yeah, you already know what it is. Until the next time, have a good day.